What's going on, everybody? This is Tommy Vex, the Lone Wolf, and you're listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Oh, hello, dude. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm Bruce. There's my partners, Rena and Chris. I appreciate you taking the time, man. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Rena. Thanks, Chris. Where are you, where, are you guys in uh, Boston or? I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm in Washington, D.C. Okay. Guess where I am? Somewhere completely different. <laughs> You're in the Golden State. I can see the bridge no. behind. Oh, yep. That's that's a complete scam. Like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? But this is a podcast version. So Reina Ringinen is in Finland. Oh, in, in Finland. Helsinki. Yeah. I've been, to, I've been to Helsinki once. Oh, you did. Tell me about yeah. that trip. Um. So I was I was on. It was 2017, and I was on tour with Five Finger Death Punch and In Flames. And two things that were very strange to me was. In Helsinki, right by the by the hotels, they opened their first Taco Bell, and it was so bizarre to us because in America, Taco Bell is not like a nice restaurant, and you guys had lines of people <laughs> waiting to get into Taco Bell and <laughs> and, and security guards, and like, it was like serious. Wow, <laughs> so, I'm so ashamed. No, but, like, awesome. let me just <laughs> no, let me just get all the glamour out of this and tell you that Finnish people will stand in the similar fucking line for a free bucket, for a free okay. motherfucking bucket. It's okay. a thing that actually happens. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> yeah. Like if a if a local version of a Target or whatever will hand out free buckets as like a gimmick for you know get some more sales. We will have those same fucking lines. We stood really? in line for Burger King for weeks. Those lines persisted in Helsinki. I wasn't kidding when I said I was ashamed. I truly am. I really, really am. <laughs> I mean, we have that here. Like we have, you know, I'm a, I collect sneakers, and there'll be people will sleep outside. Yeah. Overnight for the store to open up, and you're like, and I, I, I'm, I lived in L.A. I'm from New York City originally, and I lived in L.A. for like 16 years, and you would see people like sleeping in tents on Melrose Avenue the sneaker stores just waiting for the doors to open so they could maybe get a pair of sneakers it's, it's wild i remember when it was like that for concert tickets before yeah, the internet right. yeah. yeah oh yeah that makes sense. right oh yeah so so i remember when i was in 1997 now i'm dating myself in 1997 me and my buddies were i was in my first band we were called the dogs of war and we're a high school band and Ozfest. So we had gotten the Ozfest VHS tape of Ozfest '96, and then soon, like a month or two later, they announced Ozfest was going to be in in New Jersey. Right, we were from New York, so we got up on a Saturday morning and made my my dad drop us off to get tickets at like six forty five a.m. Because in our minds, we were like, "There's, it's going to be like." It's the only ticket master in the neighborhood. The whole neighborhood's going to be... <laughs> nobody was there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was like, we got... And it was Ozzy. Um, Ozzy and Black Sabbath. And Marilyn Manson. And Pantera. And Fear Factory. And Machine Head 5... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Power Man 5000. Neurosis. Oh. Order. Just a few and bands. Typo negative. Right, just a few bands. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mind blown. Like, mind blown. So anyway, let's bring it back to uh, Tommy Vex because I know where we sure, don't have sure. all that much time. But "Cancel the King," the new single, um, killer single, by the way. What's been oh, the response to it so far? Has it been pretty good? Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty. It's been. It's. I think that. Um, and again, like, I don't really think these. I, these. I'm not particularly putting songs out as singles. Um, now that I'm a completely independent artist, I'm, I kind of have just decided I'm going to release a track a month until the album comes out. And this song, um, you know, this was one of the first songs that I, I, some of the songs in the album were supposed to be on the Bad Wolves record. Mm -hmm. This was one of the ones that was written after the departure, um, after I was kind of dealing with, with cancel culture and, uh, 
yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I love the track. I, I worked on it with Josh Gilbert from As They Lay Dying and um, Hiram Hernandez. And uh, don't drop the kiss. Post. Yeah, I see that. Sorry, they're falling apart. Yeah. <laughs> they're getting old. Kiss has been attacking Bruce all evening. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, tell, us gonna... about, tell us about your experience with cancel culture. Uh, well, I mean, so pretty much, you know, for the past two years, I've been very outspoken about, you know, I think the overreach, the government overreach of of policy, the response to COVID, um, vaccine efficacy, um, and and kind of sort of, you know, I I never really, I didn't really identify as like conservative or Democrat or anything. I kind of was always like in the middle, and I think the. I got kind of scared into the right side of the pool by some of the extremism that I was seeing, um, you know, from, from the, the democratic party. And, and unfortunately I think that, um, I think we had, we have, I think on a global scale, I think a lot of people will relate to this, that, you know, we have a, a lack of positive options. And so, you know, I, I was very public about endorsing Donald Trump over Joe Biden. And I, to me, it was completely sane. Um, but, but obviously the media and, and, and also Trump's personality freaks people out. And so, you know, people, there were four years of people like learning to hate the guy. Um, whereas now it, it, we have Joe Biden's been our president and he's destroyed the country more he destroyed he's destroyed the country more in the first year than and I, I can't remember any president since I've been alive. Um, can you explain and, can you explain how he's destroyed the country in a year? Well, I don't to be particularly I don't think that Joe Biden is the I don't think he's in control, obviously. He's obviously suffering from um he, from a debilitating mental uh, cognitive issues but how 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 has he taken the country down explain it to me well i think all the policies of the extreme left as far as you know you see the defunding the police movement that the leftists have pushed have caused a massive spike in those, none of those policies exist though like those policies don't exist they've actually funded it more than they were before okay well so that I, I, that's what i'm confused about like they, the budget for law enforcement in the United States is three hundred and seventy million dollars more under Biden than it was under Trump. Yeah, well, after when? As of twenty twenty one. Yeah, after massive riots and burning and looting, all but things that all happened under Trump, though that didn't but, happen under Biden. But that was all for, promoted by leftist congressmen and senators and and state officials. The violence wasn't promoted by them and most certainly was i'll i'll send you a, i can send you a compilation reel even kamala harris is is condoning and saying this is what we need to do so peacefully <laughs> protest yes but not violence no, no that's that's not it's like i i live in dc i live it i like i live in the epicenter of it sure and the stuff that was going on here wasn't really that violent like there was in dc there was, I, I know in I know in Richmond, Virginia, there was a lot of violence. It was bad here. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I know in certain cities there was, was for sure. In Los Angeles, it was the same. They were they yeah. were blowing up cars. Um, I cleaned up the I cleaned up the the aftermath. So yeah. in in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, over nineteen women were raped during the George Floyd riots. There were explosions that there were, you know, I, I just got off. A po I did a podcast a couple months ago with Hawk Newsom, who's the he's a good dude. He's the founder of the BLM chapter in New York. And he's also a very controversial guy with supposedly um, completely opposing views as me. But we actually agree on many, many things that were done wrong. Um, I agree. There was a lot of stuff done wrong. I also but think Arn Paul, I think that Afghanistan was an absolute catastrophe. I think the the manner in which that they withdrew from Afghanistan was an absolute catastrophe, and uh, you have Jen Psaki and all these people saying, "Oh, there's no way we could have predicted this." Well, the people who are who are been put into position are obviously incompetent in doing their jobs that they could not have predicted the way that that would have gone because we've been doing uh, well, we 
we've been over there and in that region of the world with Intel uh, and working on the ground for over 20 years. So that's another problem. I agree. I agree. That was a catastrophe. It was ugly to watch. It was terrible. But here's, here's a question I have about that. They were kind of forced into a corner because of the way you Trump have, just said, we're out of here. So, you have, so how do you deal with it? You, have, you asked me to explain why I'm just explaining. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to rattle off the bullet points for you and then. Sure, you sure, sure. Having to talk about it. So that's, that's another thing. I think that it's as it's, uh, you know, shutting down, uh, the pipeline and then blaming Putin for the expense, the high, the, the, the hike in gas prices is absolutely ridiculous because only 3% of our crude oil comes from Russia. So that would only, it would only uh, cost us a 3% increase in gas here. And I think that the gas companies are taking advantage of the situation and the government is not regulating it, which is their responsibility. None of this would have happened if we didn't shut down those pipelines and put 73 American workers out of business. That's a fucking catastrophe that, that affects literally everyone. We're giving, we just gave away another $40 billion to Ukraine and the country is having the worst inflation that it's had in, I don't know how many years. Um, so I don't see how, what my statement is, erroneous in any way so first you, of all the uh, pipeline the sorry, pipeline comes interrupt for a moment yeah yeah because yeah. uh, you brought up ukraine and clearly like you know the u.s support to ukraine is is pretty crucial to the situation there do you think it's better that you know that you do send out help in the form of money rather than nato get involved because that is the next option and that basically means world war three then well the issue is is that I don't believe that Putin would have invaded Ukraine if, if Trump was a president. I feel like Trump, as much as Trump scared a lot of liberal people, he kept a lot of the world leaders that are psychotic. Oh my God, you have got to be kidding me. Like that this is, no. ugh, that you can, you can say a lot of things about Trump, but that dude was a lapdog to Putin. You know, he was, he was a puppet to Putin. A very like, you cannot be serious about that. I live right next to Russia. Like I'm very, very like, you know, aware of what, what's going on. And most definitely that is not the case. That is not the case that Trump was. And if he gets to power again, that's, you know, probably Putin is going to die because of his cancer that he's poorly trying to hide, you know, mm. before that happens. But there is zero fucking chance that Donald motherfucking Trump, an admitted so, rapist, a person who makes fun of handicapped people, you know, like you're you're saying, like, you know, the people were learned learning to hate him for four years. I would hate anybody, you know, walk up to me on the street and, and like tell me how cool it is to grab women by the pussy and then do this to somebody to make fun of them, that's a shit person. He deserves to be hated. Like nobody needs to be looking up to anybody like that, you know? And for me, it's just they, insane that someone they, would and, be like, this is okay. And again, this goes back to a lack of options because you have Joe Biden, who is an alleged pedophile. His son is a crackhead. His son is also, I've seen videotapes of his son raping young girls, um, which you guys are not privy to. Uh, this guy's laptop uh, and the dealings that he's done is insane. So it's it's difficult for me. Like a lot of this stuff that gets put out there, you know, I I go sit, I see these things. I know Rudy Giuliani. I know I I've, I've seen the tapes. It's it's uh, and so I'm not I'm not defending anyone's point, but I do believe that. If Joe, I believe that Joe looks absolutely incompetent. And so other fucking world leaders who are insane are going to do whatever they want because they think that the teacher's not in the classroom. That's what I think. Well, Trump was a never the teacher. Trump Trump was a threat to world security. And that was a widely like acknowledged fact, you know, that he was the biggest risk so, to face the entire globe <laughs> and since fucking Hitler, basically, you know. I'm going to take this back to uh, to the music for a second because we're we're down the rabbit hole, which I thought we would end up being anyway. But um, but, it, it, but this is the thing. This is actually good discourse because it's important for people who disagree right. to actually communicate and understand in a civil way other people's opinions, right? And I think that this is like this, like even though this interview, we have completely opposing views on political figures. 
I think it's also important for like anyone listening and audience members to understand the ability to look at each other. And, and you know, we, we could see each other in video form and, and I think empathy and understanding is so important because uh, on social media, we have digital avatars and people wind up saying things or going too far because they lose the common respect. Whereas like I can, you know, I think it's important to engage and hear what other people's experiences are, you know what I mean? And then respectfully digest that. One thing I want right. to, you, you, you touched on the pipeline and I actually want to talk about that because the closure of that pipeline directly affected my family. Okay. So my family lives in Alberta. They all work in the oil field and that pipeline was going from Alberta down in down into the US. Mm -hmm. Now, Alberta actually was the only people working on that pipeline. There was no one in the US working on it because the Supreme Court had blocked it because there, there was no proper environmental review. And they were just given a ticket. Okay, go ahead and start. So Alberta poured $4 billion into it. And there was like almost no one in the US doing anything at that point. So even if that pipeline had been said, okay, go ahead, we're going to finish it, it wouldn't be ready until at least 2024, 2025. So mm -hmm. it, has, it has no correlation on gas prices, although I do agree it should have went on, honestly. But I got I to gotta say, Tommy, that you're completely correct on what you said before. I just wanted to make a point of that, like, you know, that that is a key thing that we can disagree and still be respectful. I would still freaking give you a huge hug if we were in the same yeah. room doing this, you know, but yeah. back to the pipe. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I, and I agree. And I think like, this is like, you know, that this is the thing that like, I really wished people did more of was like, have conversations of where they had different beliefs or different information, because that's how we are all going to learn from each other. It, there was this thing about people being like, oh, those people are insane. It's like, no, they're not. They just don't believe what you believe. And unfortunately, I think over the past two years, there's been like sort of a religion made out of political views. And that's not good for anybody, right? Because, you know, you've seen throughout the course of human history when people are indoctrinated into into believing only one set of things and they have contempt prior to investigation, wars are started, you know what I mean? And it's not good for the human race. So I appreciate your guys, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that we don't completely agree on the same things and we can still talk about it. So thank you for that. No, yeah, I no, thank, thank you for like, you know, sharing your views and, and like, you know, offering those added added bits of information that, you know, Chris was asking for and so on and so on. But yeah, it's it's, you know, it's about finding a discussion culture where we can all, you know, uh, respect facts. Because, like, you know, the, I think the biggest, biggest um, uh, problem that came with the Trump administration was the normalization of the al alternative facts, as as Miss Conway, Miss yeah. Conway, yeah. You know, yeah. called them. So they normalized lying, basically. They normalized, you know, there was no big scam. No, nobody was trying to like like um, destroy the election or steal the election. There was no fucking cheating in the election. And they keep on with the big lie and they're normalizing that. And that is that is like, you know, the, I feel like, you know, that there's normalizing of, of bad behavior. The, the thing that you're sort of like trying to avoid and like, you know, you're advocating this civil conversation, but this is not fucking civil, you know? This is well, not civil. Grabbing well, people by the pussy is not civil, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. And then neither are sniffing children and smoking crack and fuck, you know what I mean? It, it, there's yeah, a but lot. So this is what aboutism, though. Like you know that this is this is again like I have not seen any proof of of those. And if you have it, please send it to me, and I'll be like promise to be open minded and accept it if if that's the case. But um, you I'll know to, the I'll entire world saw how what, how Trump was behaving, and he was making that behavior normal. You know, disrespect and misogyny. Well, you know what, all these things. This is what I'll say about that sort of stuff is like, I don't think anyone thinks that that's okay. That's what I think. I don't know anybody that thinks that that's okay. I, I just well, don't. Then, then, you know, then you wouldn't vote for a person who advocates that, you know, because like, it's basically like, I'm an awful person, someone would think, because I think every person in the Catholic church is complicit in, in child abuse when they stay in that religion because it's such a prominent 
feature of that religion. So being in it, you endorse it because, you know, you're not getting out of it. You know, you would <laughs> if, if you well, wanted to make a difference. Because you can well, worship God without that building or... No, no, I, I, listen, I'm, I am one of the most outspoken advocates against child abuse and, and child trafficking. So, and, it, and wherever it is that that is, it needs to be destroyed. I don't, I personally, my personal belief is that pedophiles are not people and that they should be put down. That's just my personal belief system. I don't you want know, to breathe the same air as them. What's up? I don't want to breathe the same air as them. Yeah, I, I don't think I think if a dog bites a child, it gets put down. Uh, and I think that if a, if an adult person uh, physically abuses a child, I don't I think they forfeit their right to be here. And I just that, that's just my belief. It, you know, that might be extreme, but I I know. Yeah, firsthand. Well, you know, I've it's, seen how it's again, like, you know, you have to take it one step further and, and like think about like how they ended up that way, because a lot of people who end up abusing children were abused as children. You know, a lot of, like that a lot of people, cycle that happens. But a lot but of to people, stop it, a lot of people who were abused would never have a child. It's a just. Yeah, I'm choice. not saying all of them. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's you choice. know, absolutely complete. Yeah, yes, but then also because, like, you know, pedophilia has uh, obviously and for a reason a huge stigma. Uh, people who have pedophilic tendencies can't find help. You know, that there's very little places where you can turn to like, fuck, I'm thinking about really messed up shit and I want to make it stop. I want to never, ever do anything to a child because there are pedophiles well, out there that will never, ever lay a finger on a child. Yeah, still, they have that, that in their head. You there, know? Are, so, there, are, there are free programs that that uh, there are sections of stuff like SLAA, like Sex and Love Addiction Anonymous that specifically are there to help people who are victims of child abuse trauma so that they don't. Um, re-engage and, and people who, uh, and I'm not saying anyone who has uh, tendencies or those issues, I'm saying people who act out on them, right? right? Like You might think about killing somebody, but you don't actually kill them, then you didn't commit a crime. True. Right, right. You know? But yeah, so I'm just like, you know, things are usually not that simple, even though like that impulse is completely understandable. I have a five-year-old, so if something happened to him, I would absolutely go and kill the person. I don't care what happened to them as a job. They would be fucking <laughs> well, dead. Hey, you know, I, that's I, should do, I don't think you should go to jail for that. Yeah. No, yeah, and like, you know, this is, yeah. this is, but then, of course, like, when you think about that, when it's like this poetic justice sort of a thing, it doesn't really function if it's on societal level that everybody gets to decide that I was crossed badly enough you know, where, where's the limit? Rape victims, do they get to kill their rapists? Like, I, I would say yes, but, you know, but then, you know, things are I mean, not black and white. Maybe the dude didn't do it, you know? Like, I, now it's fucking dead, you know? <laughs> I probably agree on a lot more of the same stuff that we disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> so, but hey, I think, we're, no, guys, no. Bruce, Chris. Um, I'll let Bruce like, go. I was just going to, Chris, if you got something, we've got like, uh, I don't know, like eight minutes left in the, in the recording here. But um, at some point, I want to bring it back to why we're here, Tommy Vexed. But uh, Chris, if you've got something to add no, go, before we get there. Ahead. Take it away. I don't mind. Tommy, what's the, uh, are you going to do the, be doing the single thing then? And how is it going forward from here? Oh, so <laughs> we're going to basically put out um, two more songs. We got one more. I just shot a video in Orlando. And uh, the song's called The War You Wanted. It's, a, an, it's actually an anti-bullying song. And I worked with the Down Syndrome Foundation of Florida and uh, the Dream Foundation, which is run by Charlie Rocket and John Chirondo. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. So there's, there's a young man named Vincent who he has Down Syndrome. He always wanted to be a wrestler. And his sister uh, was a single mom. She went on a date. She was date raped with fentanyl. And she had um, an aneurysm and she's paralyzed. So he wrote this letter saying he wanted to wrestle in the WWE to raise a million dollars to buy his sister a wheelchair, like accessible house for their family. So, you know, obviously they got the letter, you know, we, two weeks later, they put this whole event together, called in a bunch of wrestlers um, from WWE, uh, flew him to New York, put his, you know, we got, we got a hookup and they put his billboard up in Times Square. And, um, 
and we set up a real wrestling match. And so, oh, wow. uh, filmed the whole thing. And then that was about a month ago. Uh, we raised the money and so, and then I just flew back and we made him the star of the new music video and this song. Um, I'm going to be granting him all like the publishing rights. So he can use the song forever, you know, in his wrestling career. And we're working on getting him a contract with WWE so that he's the first pro wrestler with down syndrome um, oh. and federation history. Yeah. So, and I, I've been working with that foundation since about 2017 and, you know, they do great work and, you know, I, I really, um, it, those kids kind of will change you, you know, they're so innocent and, and, you know, they're, they're really misunderstood. They're very special. And they all have like very um, specific things that they're almost extraordinary at. It's like almost inhuman. They, they, they kind of zone in on one thing and that's what, and they know everything about it. Um, and, and so, you know, the, anything that supports the foundation and they raise a lot of money helping these families who have, who have down syndrome family members to like live their most full life. Um, and it was about that, you know, it's a good thing. Thank you, my friend for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having, th thanks for having me on. I, I, I really, I appreciated, uh, you know, the information that you guys had to, and I'm glad that we can, I, it's very good to be able to not agree and still have our humanity. You know what I mean? It's mandatory. I hundred yeah. percent agree. Like Rena said, I mean, we could all just hug it out and just agree to disagree and that's fine. But when I, I also, learned, I also learned that, uh, you know, about the pipeline, you know, starting in Canada and not having, even, having even uh, initiated the jobs here. Yeah. Um, and that it took. So I learned something too, by being, by listening. We it, really, all, it really affected Alberta bad. Yeah. Badly, yeah. but, but it wouldn't be done, you know, and, and it should, it should have been done, but it was blocked by the Supreme court of the United States yeah. for, for environmental review. But, and then Trump just said, well, build it anyways, but they didn't know if they should or not, because what was going to happen with that. Mm -hmm. So what do you, I actually wanted to ask, what do you, what, do you think the implications of the of the Russia Ukraine, uh, you know, this Russian invasion is going to play out like like your guys' specs? Well, my thought is is that there's going to be a famine in Africa and uh, in Southeast Asia. There's going to be a massive famine, um, and that's going to put uh, a, a huge inflationary rate on commodities like grain, for instance. Is, is that because Russia is a huge exporter of grain or Ukraine? Ukraine, so, yeah. Ukraine oh, supplies thirty three percent of all of the food for uh, Africa and Southeast Asia. Thirty three percent, and they're not planting right now. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously they can't. Right. No. So um, there's going to be huge inflationary pressure, plus the fact that Europe is now about to stop taking Russian oil. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, the government needs to regulate uh, gas and oil companies. Mm -hmm. They absolutely do because they're making record profits right now. Yeah, and the, but they're like, oh, inflation, inflation. But there's not one government, there's not one party that would even think about doing that, and I don't understand why. Because if, like, for instance, if Biden said, "That's it, we're putting a cap. You can only say thirty percent profit max." The Republicans yeah. would say, it's a free market, it's a free market, it's a free market, you can't do that. And then there would be this pushback. If the Republicans went in and said, hey, we're, we're going to put a 30% tax on this or we're a cap on this, uh, their whole party would revolt against them because it's against the free market. So yeah. the free market doesn't work in certain situations, right? Like the free market doesn't work in education, it doesn't work in healthcare, it doesn't work in childcare. And when it comes to the necessities, like gasoline, for instance, right, it can work until the companies decide, hey, we got a monopoly on this. We don't care. Right, Jack. Well, I think that's one of the, the issues that the both the two party system are failing. Uh, they're so at war with each other. They're not able to see the value in moderation and compromise. And yeah. until we get back to that sort of a place where yeah. where everyone's more leaning towards the middle we're not going to have 
we're not going to be able to deal with these kind of problems in any way that in any manner in which it is progressive. But so, I'll, say that, I'll say this as well. Being from Canada and knowing people all over the world from my job, in the U.S., I find it strange that everyone is blaming the president for inflation because the entire world is, you know, the going, through the, is going through oh. the exact same situation. Yeah, we had a pandemic. That's what did this. You yeah, know? I mean, China, uh, the supply, the global supply chain shut down and they yeah. can't get they can't get started back up. So yeah. but just, it's well, it's it's unique in America that they blame the president for inflation. The rest of the world is like. No, we don't. I don't. When when I was saying the inflation is high, the the fact that inflation is so high means that we shouldn't be allocating so much money to other countries. We are not only just Ukraine; we're giving tons of other countries money, which we've always done, um, and that serves a purpose for the USD. But at, at the same time, we're not in a position um, financially because of the of the pandemic to be spending that. You know, and as, and there's other things too. It's like there's other. Um, but how do you balance out the cost? So, like, like for instance, right now the U.S. dollar is the number, the world's reserve currency, right? Everyone holds it. If they don't keep that going, China takes that over. What happens if China takes over the world reserve currency? Would it have been Would it have been worth spending the American money to stop that from happening? Well, to be honest with you, the the up the the up and down of it is is that the industrial war complex is the solution to this, but it's it's problematic. It is, because, yeah. Because if we ha if we put boots on the ground and we we could, I mean, our military could easily just shut this down easily, and it would it would benefit us financially because then you know Lockheed Martin Martin would step in and go up and and all the defense contracts and all this other stuff. Um, you know, but then what does that look like? You know, yeah, it's terrible. Then, it's a nuclear war. Then we have to get into, you know, then we have to initiate a war with a, with that nation, um, which a lot of people don't want to do, especially right now, because most Americans don't feel, and I don't think most Americans have felt, I, I would say 50% of Americans have not felt like we've had competent leadership for uh, six years. <laughs> so yeah. nobody. No one I, 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 I'll, I'll be honest with you. Most of the world doesn't think the U.S. has had competent military leadership since George W. Bush. Correct. Like, Correct. like the, the general like global population. I'm not talking about the United States in general. No, that, that's, a, that's a completely on point. Yeah. So, and I don't know, like I've only lived in the U.S. now for about, what, five years? Mm -hmm. But, but from what I've seen, like there's never any well thought out strategies by anyone. It's just do this because there's too many small players and too many. Correct. I think there's three too many little things. Oh, sorry. My alarm's going off. I, I We're up against time here. We've got oh, about 30 sorry. seconds. No, you're fine. I enjoyed this conversation, but zoom has less than 30 seconds left. So, oh, okay. Cool. If you want to get your last point in, Tommy, that's fine, but we can uh, call it there. No, no, just grateful to talk to you guys, man. Thank you guys for, uh, for thank the you conversation. For, yeah, thank you for uh, putting up with us and, uh, and the good discourse. Yeah, of course, man. Always happy to have a conversation. All right, take her easy, man. All right, well, guys, good luck with the care. record. We'll talk Peace. to you soon. All right, bye. All right, bye. Bye. Chris Saliva. Okay. Yes, we're out there, everyone. I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. Together we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi-weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Nimba the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you!